Hello guys and gals, and we are back with another reading of Phantasmagoria. This is going to be a 12-part series, I see that now, so we are almost to the end. Uh, oh wait, it would be 13 if we decided to go over the maps, and we probably will, so it'll probably be a 13-part thing. Anyways, Phantasmagoria is by Julia Bruce, and it is an atlas of fabulous creatures, enchanted beings, and magical monsters. In the last episode, we read about dragons. Lots and lots of dragons. Uh, let me check my notes here real quick. It looks like we talked about satyrs, dragon lore, Chinese, Japanese, and Greek dragons. We are going to start this reading with um, dragon slayers. Talk about dragons, then we're going to talk about people who kill dragons. Okay. As always, this book is copyright 2009. Water horses. Okay, let's find our place. I need to invest in a bookmark, apparently. Okay, we talked about the Greek dragons, and we are two dragon slayers. This is where we are starting. Okay, let me just get positioned better so I can get better camera angles here. With my phone. I need to invest in a better camera. I know that. Okay, or I could at least use a tripod. Anyways, it says Dragon Slayers. Let's take a look at this. Uh, giant scaly wing, giant scaly winged and fire breathing. These vicious, with with vicious teeth and talons, and perhaps spitting poison too. Dragons must surely be the most terrifying of adversaries. There are many legends across the world of good overcoming evil when brave heroes slay dragons. Here are some examples. We are going to just take this, you know, in the normal way. That's interesting. Um, okay, it says here, St. George and the Dragon. When a terrible dragon made it its nest beside a spring in Cappadocia, in modern-day Turkey, the local people were presented with a terrible problem. The spring was their only source of water. But to reach it, they had to get past the dragon. At first, they managed to lure it away by offering it sheep to eat. But eventually, a supply of sheep ran out. Unfortunately for the young girls of the area, the only solution seemed to be offered them to the dragon instead of the sheep. Girls were selected for, their, for this terrible sacrifice by drawing lots, until one day, it was the king's daughter herself who drew the, lot, the, final, the fatal lot. The king begged for her to be spared, but the people insisted that she must take her turn. Luckily for her, as she was waiting for the awful creature to devour her, George, a brave Ro Roman soldier, passing through the country, came upon the unhappy scene. He sprang into action, protecting himself against the dragon by using the sign of the Christian cross. He took his lance and slew the giant beast, saving the princess. The grateful people of Cappadocia immediately converted from, the pagan religion, from their pagan religion to Christianity. Okay, so this says um, St. George was born near Jerusalem and is the patron saint of England, Ethiopia, Georgia, Greece, Palestine, um, Portugal, and Russia. Okay, you know, I said we were going to read these in order, but um, since we're already on this page, we're going to read about... Sigurd and the Dragon. I think I've read this one before. In Scandinavian mythology, there is a story about a dwarf king called Ridmar, who had three sons, Fafner, Otter, and, Re and Rigen. Or, is that Regen? It's like rain, except the letters are different. One day, Otter was killed by the god Loki, and in, in recompense, the gods gave the dwarf king a, a great fortune in gold. The king's remaining sons wanted the gold for themselves and eventually killed their father for it. Fafner, however, decided he didn't want to share the treasure with his brother. He stole it and fled to another land. Here, he transformed into a terrible wingless dragon so he could better guard his horde. In time, Regan became stepfather to a boy called Sigurd. When Sigurd grew up, Regan ordered him to find Fafner and retrieve the gold. When Sigurd found the dragon, he dug a trench across the, a path the monster regularly used. He hid in the trench, and as the dragon stepped over, over him, he thrust his sword into the beast's belly and killed him. 
he was drenched in the dragon's blood, which miraculously gave him the power to understand all languages, including those of animals. He was warned by the birds. He was war warned by a bird that his stepfather Riggin intended to kill him. Sigurd slew Riggin before he could act, keeping all the gold for himself. But the fortune brought him no happiness. That's kind of a sad story. Okay, let's read about Susa, Susa no and Yamamata no Orichi. I'm probably terrible with Japanese, and I apologize. It says, Susa no O, Japanese god of storms, was wandering the earth when he came across an elderly couple weeping over a beautiful young girl. Uh, they were her parents, and they were weeping because Yamamoto no Orichi, a terrible eight-headed dragon, had devoured her seven sisters and would soon return for her, the eighth. The couple promised he could marry the girl if he slew the dragon, so Susa Noo came up with a clever plan. He told the parents to make eight large tubs of sake rice wine, and then he waited. waited. Finally, the monster came for the girl. It was a terrible sight, the length of eight hills, with trees growing along its back and eight spiked tails. Uh, when it saw the sake, it drank each head in it, sank each head in into a tub and greedily drank down all the wine. Before long, all eight heads were hopelessly drunk and fell asleep. susano -o cut the stupefied dragon to pieces. And that was... Oh, wait, it says here. Uh, the Japanese legend susano -o sl slays the terrible dragon and gets the girl. Okay. And up here it says, um... Oh, yeah, that's um, Regan um, killing the dragon because he dug the, tent, the trench. Um, above. Yeah, Sigurd and the dragon. Okay. Next, we have Four Legged Fiends. Uh, and again, with the maps, I'm probably going to just de devote a, a, a video to this, just the maps. But we're going to read this first. Um, beasts, um, patched together from several different creatures or familiar animal, animal friends turn bad. This collection of four-legged fiends horrify and fascinate in equal measure. For the terrifying three-headed Cerberus and the crocodile-head Amut, both denizens of the underworld, to the vampire cat of Japan and the cunning Greek sphinx, these creatures guard their territories jealously. It's a brave person who dares to take them on. Few heroes have succeeded in conquering these monsters. However, some by force, some by force, others by cunning, and all with good, with a good deal of courage. So we are just going to pan over this really quick, and we are going to move on. This is going to be the chapter on four-legged fiends. Looks like we're going to start with vampire cats. I've never heard of this, to be honest. Some of the most frightening moments happen when normal or familiar things turn bad. Look again at that sweet bundle of fur that shares your house and purrs in front of your hearth. Does an evil vampire heart lurk within? This Japanese legend tells of such an animal. Now, fabulous fact. We are going to read this fabulous fact while we look into these luminous cat eyes. Um, the, a the Ainu people of Japan believe that if a person kills a cat, it will avenge itself by bewitching them. They are condemned to waste away and die, all the while believing, behaving like a cat and meowing pitifully. The, this bizarre death can only be prevented if the person eats some part of the, of the cat they have killed. And that sounds very unpleasant. Okay, it says here the... The unearthly shine of a cat's eyes when caught in the light and their unnerving, unblinking stare may well be fuel be fueled stories uh, may have fueled stories about them having supernatural or somewhat evil powers. But first, let's read about this right here about foxes or something. Vampire foxes. Uh, the who the the who sign of China are evil, shape-shifting fox spirits that can take on human form. They drain the life out of their human lovers to increase their own strength, but they cannot resist wine. And if they get drunk, they lose their human appearance, revealing their true and terrible nature. Japanese myths also feature fox spirits called kitsune that take, uh, take human form. Some feed on their lovers, like the 
the who sign, the who sign, but most kitsune are magical, mischievous, long-lived, and wise. Okay, it says here uh, in one of the stories about kitsune, a fox, a fox woman called Kuzinoa married a man who saves her from hunters. Only her shadow gives away her true identity. Okay. Now let's read about the vampire cats. The vampire cat of Nabeshima. Nab, um, Nabeshima. Uh, again, I'm probably butchering that, but I'm not good with Japanese. Um, there once was a prince who was in love with a beautiful maiden. One day when they had been out walking, they were followed home by a large cat. That night at midnight, the cat crept into the girl's bedroom, leapt upon her neck, and bit her to death. It dragged her body into the garden, dug a hole, and buried her bloody corpse. Then it assumed the shape of the girl, and no one, not even the prince, was any the wiser. But from that day onwards, the prince's strength began to ebb away. He became pale and listless, and he was troubled in his sleep by terrifying dreams. His doctors were at a loss as to what was wrong, for little did they realize that each night the cat girl visited the prince and drained the life force from him. The people of the prince's court became concerned about his dreams, and a battalion of soldiers was ordered to keep watch over him at night. But each evening, at ten o'clock, the soldiers were seized by an irresistible drowsiness and fell asleep. Then one day, a loyal and gentle soldier called Ito Soda came to the palace and begged to be allowed to keep guard one night. The prince's advisors agreed. They, um, they warned him about the strange drowsiness that had overcome the other soldiers, so Ito Soda went prepared. When ten o'clock came and he felt the drowsiness creep over him, he stuck a small, a, a small knife into his thigh, twisting it every time he felt sleepy. The pain kept him awake, and at midnight he saw the girl creep silently into the room. As she approached the prince, she saw that Ito Soda was still awake and questioned him. He, ex he explained... That he explained what he had done, and she left, unable to perform her nightly transformation. This happened again the next night. On the third night, the girl didn't come at all, and the other soldiers stayed awake. By this time, the prince, having avoided the, hor the horrors of the cat's visit for several nights, had slept well and was looking much better. Uh, Ito Soda was convinced by this that the girl was the source of the trouble. He decided to go to her room and confront her, under attack, the girl fought back fiercely, but realized she could not win. She turned back into a cat, clawed her way up the wall, out onto the roof, and away. Um, uh, what, what, oh, wipe the wall, onto the roof, and away. She escaped into the mountains, and there she stayed, making much trouble and mischief for the local, the local people. Finally, the prince ordered a massive hunt for her, and she was found and killed. As for Ito Soda, he was he was richly rewarded for his loyalty and cleverness. Okay, we are done with Vampire Cats, and we are now going to read The Griffin, it looks like. Yes, The Griffin. And there's different pictures of griffins, I guess. Okay. Uh, let me just check my battery real quick. Okay, still got some power. Ah, uh, the griffin, with the golden-furred body of a lion, the king of the beast, and the proud head and wings and talons of an eagle, the king of the birds, the griffin is the most majestic of all mythological beasts. It is a symbol of strength and protection, and was once the guardian of priceless hordes of gold in the kingdoms of ancient Arabia and India. Uh, we're going to read this fantastical fact first. It says, um, in medieval times, griffins' claws were said to be able to detect poison and were highly prized, in fact, Supposed griffin claws from this time have turned up, up to be ibex horns, and ibex is a type of goat. Technically, it's a type of antelope, but who's counting? Okay, it says, although it is a although it is majestic, the griffin is, is also a powerful and sometimes terrifying creature. To the ancient Egyptians and Persians, griffins represented dark, evil powers. In some stories, they were vicious and greedy attacking anything that came near them. In India, ancient, Ara India, ancient Arabia, and ancient Greece, 
their great fierceness was put to good use in their role as guardians of treasure or protectors of sacred places and important people. There are legends about Alexander the Great, the Greek conquering hero who lived over 2,000 years ago in which he tames eight griffins, harnessing them to a chariot and flying to the heavens. In medieval times, griffins became popular beasts to feature on coats of arms as they represented desirable qualities such as strength and watchfulness. This says, um, the strong, loyal, and overwatching, watchful griffin was a popular figure on coat of arms. Symbol of, of empire. The Roman myth, in Roman mythology, griffins pulled the chariot of Nemesis, the goddess of justice, who flew around the world, helping the good and punishing the wicked by running over them with her chariot wheels. This link with this link with law and justice prompted the Romans to take the griffin as their symbol of the, of their empire, representing the principles of government they carried with them. As the empire spread across the known world, the Romans also used images of griffins on graves, as it was believed they would protect the dead and guide their souls safely to the afterlife. Now let's read about questing beasts. It says, lions were a popular choice in the makeup of, fanta of fantastical animals. They were, um, there were griffins, the chimera, manicores, sphinxes, and perhaps, strangest of all, the medieval questing beast, which appears in the English legend of King Arthur. This peculiar creature, with a serpent's head, a leopard's body, a lion's hindquarters, and the hooves of a deer, were, were, was constantly running to seek water with which to slake its unquenchable thirst. Unfortunately, it poisoned the water it drank from. As the beast ran, its belly made the sound like a pack of, of hounds braying when, when looking or questing for their quarry. It says, right, King Arthur wakes from a dream to see a questing beast drinking next to him. Uh, this one is um, part eagle, part lion, a giant, and powerful griffin takes to the skies. Okay, let's continue reading this. Uh, Griffins and Harry Potter. In the Harry Potter books, Gryffindor is the name of the school, the schoolhouse that Harry and his friends belong to. Although it symbolizes a lion rather than a griffin, the qualities of strength, courage, and vigilance that the griffin embodies are very much the, those prized by the house and its founder, uh, Godric Gryffindor. Hippogriffs, which are a strange combination of the front part of a horse and the back part of, I mean, excuse me, hippogriffs, which are a strange combination of the front part of a griffin and the back part of a horse, also appear in Harry Potter books. These weird creatures were invented by, by an Italian poet, Ludov, Ludovico Aristo, 500 years ago. There was a saying at the time that described an impossible task of being like trying to cross griffins with horses because griffins and horses were said to be mortal enemies. Aristo thought it would be amusing to imagine what the offspring of a griffin and a horse would look like, and came up with a hippogriff. Hippo meaning horse in Latin. Um, and moving on. We are to the Sphinx. We will be reading two more entries. One more after this one, rather. Uh, Sphinx. Either the gentle symbol of the rising sun or bloodthirsty monster, the Sphinx has two distinctly different character characters depending on whether it is Egyptian or Greek. What, what the two types do have in common, however, is that they both have the body of a lion but the head of another creature. The ancient Egyptians believed that their, that their gods and pharaohs had close links with per particular animals. One of the ways they demonstrated the, these beliefs was by making figures that were part man and part animal. They called such figures um, Shesep Ankh, um, which means living statue. This eventually became Sphinx. Sphinxes and lions, but Sphinxes had lions' bodies and the heads of either rams, hawks, or people. They were the gardens of tombs, sacred roads, and pyramids, and represented the rising sun. Okay, so we are going to talk about the Egyptian Sphinx right now. Uh, the most famous of all sphinxes is the huge statue in the desert beside the Great Pyramids of Giza, which has the body of a lion and the head of a pharaoh. The monument is over 70 meters, 230 feet long, and was carved out of the rock 
more than 4,500 years ago. About a thousand years after it was finished, it had become almost completely covered by the shifting desert sands, with only the head still visible. It is said that around this time a young prince fell asleep under, the, under its shadow. The sphinx appeared to him in a dream and told him that if he cleared away the sand, he would become pharaoh. The dream came true. The prince shifted the sand from around the statue and became pharaoh Teth Tethmosis IV. Okay, the riddle of the Great Sphinx. Moving in or out of the city of Thebes in ancient Greece was a, was a treacherous business. Travelers had to get past the cunning Sphinx, a monstrous creature that had the head, of a, head and chest of a woman and the body of a lion, the wings of an eagle, and the tail of a serpent. She lay in wait on the cliffs and loomed over the, the only pass into the city, waiting to challenge people with a riddle. If they failed to solve... It, this hideous monster would strangle and devour them without a second hesita without a second's hesitation. The riddle of the Sphinx was this: What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three legs in the evening, and ha and is weakest when it walks on the most? No one had ever managed to solve it. All had been eaten. Then one day, a man called Oedipus approached her. He, f he had a flash of inspiration and said that the answer was a man, for he crawls on all fours as a baby, walks on two legs as a man, and leans on the stick to help him in old age. He is the weakest when he is a baby. Um, incandescent with rage and that someone had at, le at, le at last solved her puzzle, the Sphinx screamed and threw herself off the cliff, smashing into thousands of tiny pieces on the rocks below. Not surprisingly, the grateful people of Thebes made Oedipus their king. I think that was probably Oedipus Rex. Okay, it says left. Card from solid bedrock, this 4,500-year-old sphinx looms over the Egyptian desert in the company of the pyramids. And now we're going to talk about the, the manticore, which is this picture that we've been looking at. The manticore. Uh, it says, um, the bloodthirsty manticore is said to have an insatiable appetite for human flesh. Good to know. Okay, the manticore. Uh, at first glance, the manticore of Persia, modern-day Iran, India, and Ethiopia appears very much like the Egyptian sphinx, having the body of a red lion and the hu and a human head. But the similarity that but there the, the similarities end. Und unlike the gentle Egyptian sphinx, the manticore is a terrifying and bloodthirsty monster. In its mouth are three rows of sharp teeth, and it uses a strangely alluring trumpeting call to draw its victim near. The beast may be horned, winged, or both, and have a tail of a scorpion or dragon with poisonous spikes, which it can shoot out like darts. This vicious animal, its name meaning man-eater, um, pursues its quarry with relentless speed, then paralyzes its victims with poison from its tail spines. It will completely devour its unfortunate prey, bones, clothing, possessions, and all. That was the Sphinx, and we will read one more, and it is Amut. I think that's pronounced right, I don't know. Amut. Okay, it says, Devour, eater of hearts, bone eater, and the great the greatness of death. The ancient Egyptian figure of Amut has many names, each more horrifying than the next, but this is fitting when you consider Amut's task, to sit at the judgment of the dead and eat the unworthy hearts of the wicked. Okay, let's read about the, fan the fantastical fact here. The animals that made up the fearsome body of Amut were those regarded as the most dangerous in Egypt at the time. Um, even today in Africa, hippopotamuses kill more people than any other large animal, including lions and crocodiles. Let's see. It says here, uh, Many Egyptian gods and goddesses were shown with the heads of beasts and, and birds as symbols of their roles and abilities. This is Thoth, god of wisdom, and... The head, and he has the head of an ibis. Toth, yep. Anubis. We're going to read about Anubis next. Um, Anubis, excuse me. Anubis was the gatekeeper of the underworld, guardian of the tombs, and the god of, of embalming. He is shown as having the head of a jackal or a dog. Jackals were associated with death because they were scavengers and likely to dig up, the, up dead bodies. Anubis is jet black, and the same color as the dead body, as that 
color that dead bodies turn when they have been embalmed. No one knows for sure where the name Anubis comes from, but some think it might be an ancient Egyptian word that means to purify or rot. No, to putrefy or rot. Others think it could mean royal child, as Anubis was the child of Osiris, king of the underworld. Anubis had the, ver the, the vitally important job of protecting the dead on their journey to the, the, way, to the weighing of the heart ceremony and on to the afterlife. Professional embalmers often wore Anubis masks while they went about their grisly business of turning dead bodies into mummies. The thing here says, Jackal-headed Anubis was once the lord of the afterlife and the god, uh, until the god Osiris took over. Afterwards, he remained the god of embalming and guardian of the dead. Okay, let's read about um, Amut. The ancient Egyptians believed that when a person died, their ka, or life force, traveled to the underworld, where it was led to a pair of scales. Their heart was weighed against the feather of truth by Anubis, the god of embalming. The results were recorded by Toth, the god of wisdom, in writing. If the heart was lighter than the feather, the ka would pass on to the afterlife. If, if it was heavier, a moot, denizen of the underworld, sat ready and waiting to devour it. The soul was then doomed to be restless forever. A moot was not a god, but more like a demon. She was not worshipped, but she was certainly feared. And feared and very scary to look at, with the head of a crocodile or dog and the upper body of a lion or leopard and the rear end of a hippopotamus. She behaved, oh, she believed that Amut stood by a lake of fire, casting the un unworthy hearts into the lake rather than eating them. Others feared that she ate the whole person rather than just the heart. The body then dissolved in her stomach. Okay, protective measures. Uh, fortunately for some, even if you had not led a perfect life, you could protect yourself from a moot if you were rich or, and clever enough to have sacred amulets such as scarabs folded in your wrappings. When your body was embalmed and mummified, these would prevent Anubis and a moot from discovering any of your guilty secrets, which might otherwise have made your heart too heavy to pass the ultimate test. Um, I believe that's it. We will continue with the next one with Cerberus. We have been reading from Phantasmagoria. It is a book by Julia Bruce, an atlas of fabulous creatures, enchanted beings, and magical monsters. And if you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and, <coughs> and excuse me, and ring the bell so you can know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way, all the information will be in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching, everyone. And have a great day.